Ted Chabazinski was born to a mother who had been locked up in a state hospital of schizophrenic. Because of this, Ted was given the label of schizophrenic two. And at the age of six, he was torn from his foster parents and experimented on with electroshock at New York's Bellevue Hospital by the famous and notorious child psychiatrist Loretta Bender. Just as now, when millions of children are being abused by psychiatry, none of her colleagues raised their voices to protest what was done to Ted and hundreds of other children. At, at, after Bellevue, Ted was sent to Rockland State Hospital, where he spent the rest of his childhood. Released at age 17, he went on to work his way through college, graduating with honors, and later in life became an attorney. Ted is well known for his activism in our movement. Early on, he traveled across the United States, bringing groups scattered around the country into a national movement. He helped also helped connect groups here and in Europe with one another. He is most proud of his work organizing the ballot measure in Berkeley, California to ban shock treatment there, one of the first times anywhere in the world that voters took a stand against the abuses of psychiatry. Ted has worked most of his life to try to keep others, especially children, from being abused the way he was. He calls on everyone to recognize the threat that organized psychiatry poses to the freedom of everyone in our society. Here you are, Ch Ted Chabazinski. Right yeah, thank you. Um, well, Max already given you my Cliff Notes version of my life story, so I won't go into it too much. I was going to introduce myself by saying, I'm Ted Chapisins and I'm not a psychiatrist. And the way you can tell that I'm not a psychiatrist, because besides the fact that I'm not wearing a badge, is that I have some expression on my face. Look across the street. Look across this look at these people across the street, they're like zombies. And there's a reason for that. And the reason you have to be a zombie to do practice psychiatry the way it's usually practiced. That is you have to be completely turned off to what you're doing to other people. And I wonder what diagnostic category that would fit into. Well, uh, this is not a joke. Do you have people, let's see, I don't really have the DSM-4 in front of me here, obviously, so I'm not a big fan of that book. But um, what are the symptoms of sociopathic personality? You tend not to, not to relate to people in any fashion, you completely use them for your own purposes. You're unable to have a real close relationships with anyone. You're willing to commit crimes if you can get away with it. Who does this describe besides the 20,000 people at this convention? Well, they really do fit the diagnosis of sociopathic personality. I want to repeat something. Oh, it's not a joke. And I think we should be raising this issue. And, of course, I'm beating this dead horse here, but we should not lose sight. I like to remind people whenever I get the chance that with the DSM-5, uh, what they've done is they've made everyone in this... I took a quick look at, you know, when they were publicizing their, the, the early version of it, and in my very rough calculation, DSM-5 would describe about 80% of the population as mentally ill. And this is not a joke either. And I think people need to know that because they think of us as these weird, strange... Look at all you weird, strange people with your weird, strange signs. Huh? Yeah. And look at all those weird, strange people without any signs. Who's weirder and stranger, do you think? But anyway, in Philadelphia, I talked about these children that I, rec that I um, represented at hearings a few months before, and I want to go through that again, especially what's been on my mind is this five-year-old who reminded me an awful lot about myself. She, she'd been, you know, you know, the typical story of a foster child sexually molested, abandoned by her parents. The mother was a prostitute, the father was a drug addict, you know very standard issue, foster childhood, right? And of course she was very upset, so she would have these huge tantrums. And it was clear to me what she wanted. She wanted somebody to tell her that they cared about her. And so I arrived on the ward, and there was this little girl screaming, crying, jumping up and down, banging the wall, cursing. She cursed pretty good for a five-year-old. And um, and this staff member was there, and the idea that they could comfort her, comfort her, 
The idea of comforting somebody is just totally foreign to these people. You wonder what species they are. So this, 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 this um, staff person was sitting by the door. She was in this, what do they call it? The uh, quiet room, meaning a seclusion room, where the door was open. And I'd already spoken to this little girl, and he was standing there saying, well, we'll let you out of the room when you stop this, blah, 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 when you get well, blah, 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 blah. And I kind of squatted down, got at her level, and I said, how are you doing? And she stopped crying when I talked to her. It doesn't take very much. And she was too young to understand what I told some of the older children, which is, of course, I've been through that. What she was doing at age five, I did at age seven. I was torn, as Matt described, to you away from my foster parents, given shock treatment. And I just didn't know what to do. It's, it's, I'm a lawyer now, I know what to do now. It's, I'm gonna sue your ass, right? But at age seven, you don't make that threat. <laughs> at age seven, you just totally lose it. So I totally lost it, and this was a symptom of my illness, right? Yeah, right. I think that if there is a real illness, this, this sociopathic personality was the cause of my problem. Uh, there was another boy there about my age when I got out. He was 17, too. He was locked up in this ward because he was, um, he was going around threatening suicide. And he said to me, um, I don't know why they put me on the psych ward because everybody else in my group home Actually, a lot of them even tried to kill themselves, and they didn't send them to a psych ward. Now absorb that for a minute, okay? He's basically saying kids in these group homes are in such a state of despair, a huge percentage of them are suicidal. And how is that treated? And first of all, where does this come from? Wouldn't you feel a lot of despair if you were 15, 14, 16 years old? Your parents had abandoned you. You probably had sexual um, abuse. You had nothing to look forward to in your life. You were being treated like a thing. They probably had you on psychiatric drugs. Of course you'd feel despair. Um, but I really just resonated to this kid because I also, I was 17 and I was about to get out and I knew exactly how it felt having spent your whole life in this kind of situation. Where is the humanity here? I mean, these group homes and the child welfare system have been so totally contaminated by psychiatric thinking that you do the same thing. Hey, if a kid is suicidal, you sit down and talk to the kid. What I said to this 17-year-old, I said, look, you know, you're 17, and in less than a year, you're going to be 18, you're going to be out of the system, you're going to have some control over your own life. I wish that I'd been able to stay in touch with him and just like when I went on that unit and I told these kids, I know how you feel because I was locked up from age six to 17. I know. And you wouldn't believe the way they responded because they respond to human, they want human contact and respect and nurturing. And as soon as I said this to them, they were totally different. There was this 14 year old girl who apparently was pregnant by a staff member in her group home. And I saw her with the staff, and she knew how to, um, you know, block them out. You know, she knew how to keep them there, you know. But with me, she just opened up and we're chatting, and she's talking about her life, and I'm talking about mine. And I didn't do anything. Uh, you know, this didn't take any great interpersonal therapy skills. I wasn't relating to them like a therapist. I was relating to them like another human being. And so here we have a whole profession, and they seem to be completely unable to get the idea that when people are in emotional distress, they need comforting, they need human contact, and maybe the reason is there's a great lack, they lack humanity. That's like another species. Now, I'm not saying every psychiatrist is bad, and I just briefly conversed with some people. I don't know if they're still there. I'm sure there are psychiatrists, probably the younger ones, that haven't figured out yet what they got into. But of course there's, uh, there's uh, exceptions, but the typical psychiatrist, have you ever had a conversation with a typical, other than the ones you were forced to talk to, which is bad enough? What typical even, psychiatrist? What? Psychiatrist? Well, they don't have any feelings. It's like talking to a zombie. They don't, they're not, they seem to be completely unable to relate to human beings. And I think part of it is, 
if they had empathy, then how would they feel about what they're doing to people? Because they know perfectly well what the drugs do. They know perfectly well what shock treatment does. They know perfectly well what it feels like. Well, they don't feel it, but they see. Well, they don't know how it feels, but if they are looking at, they're paying attention to the people that are locked up that they see every day when they go on the wards, they know how it feels. No, they don't know how anything feels because they apparently don't have any emotions at all. And this is not just to put them down. I think you should really contemplate this. They really are like this. And these, unfortunately, are the people that are the models. For me. It's like a religion, you know? It's like, it's like the popes who preached, you know, the medieval popes who preached celibacy, and they had harems, literally. It's like that, you know? So they're preaching, this is the way to live. I don't want to live that way, and I'm not that way. And I modeled myself against the people. When I grew up, you know, usually you model yourself after your mom or some, you know, some nurturing person. I modeled myself to be the opposite of the people that I was surrounded with. Anyway, I think I probably spoke longer than I intended to. But I, I think you should contemplate trying to communicate that to people. But if these people, they're not somebody to emulate, and why is it they're completely, on any, any emotional distress, if you weren't contaminated by the psychiatric way of thinking, if you're a kind of person who's nurturing and, and capable of affection, I mean, when I see somebody in distress, even if they're a total stranger, I try to comfort them. That's what most people need. They need a safe place where they can, I experienced that in Vancouver, but I don't want to ramble on to another subject. Anyway, we're dealing with a bunch of people who I don't know, to me they seem like another species. For sure they think that I'm another species because they treated me that way. Let's throw it back at them. Yeah.